the birthplace of devils and the endpoint for truly evil souls, the Nine Hells is a legendary place. Known at least in name by even the lowliest of commoners, there is not a person in the world that doesn't fear its fame or run from its grasp. In Dungeons and Dragons, Hell, or the Nine Hells as it is called here, is simply one of the several lower planes that exist within the cosmology of the universe. Here are all of the outer planes, which are separated into four major categories. Planes of Law, which are on the left, the Planes of Chaos, which are on the right, the Planes of Good, which are at the top, and then the Planes of Evil, which are at the bottom. Uh, the closer a particular plane is to each of these cardinal directions, the more influence the plane has towards those fundamental forces. The Nine Hells rest here, centered squarely between the influence of law and evil, hence why the Hells is considered the primary plane for lawful evil forces, those being creatures that delight in empowering themselves, tormenting others, or indulging in their base desires by utilizing societal constructs such as hierarchies, enforceable agreements such as diabolical contracts, or simple rules and regulations that fundamentally are designed to oppress. Those kinds of souls would revel in the Nine Hells. Now, the reason the Nine Hells is called the Nine Hells is because there are, in fact, nine of these Hells. The plane is structured like nine different lands of sorts, each of which lays on top or below the other. At the highest point is Avernus, the topic of this video, followed then by Dis, Minoras, Phlegethos, Stygia, Malbolge, Maladumini, Cania, and lastly, Nessus. A passage from one hell to the other is usually fairly restrictive, as those locations tend to be fairly well guarded. However, the concept of how one actually goes through those passages is actually fairly straightforward. Going down will get you to a lower hell, whereas going up will get you to a higher hell. So if you intend on going up, finding the highest mountain will usually do the trick, whereas going down, well, falling off a cliff will usually also do it. Now, today we're going to focus specifically on Avernus, the very first layer of the Nine Hells. But before we start, let, let's just do this very small exercise of why should you care? Like, why is Avernus even important? Why is it cool? Why should you want to know more about this one particular hell? Well, first, Avernus is the main staging ground for the Blood War, the fight between the devils and the demons, a war that effectively might decide the fate of the multiverse at large. The greatest war of Dungeons and Dragons, far greater than even the one fought between the Githyanki and the Mind Flayers. Now, second, any creature that makes it into the Nine Hells, whether they are evil souls sent here to become devils, or adventurers seeking fame, fortune, or questing, will enter the Nine Hells always, always through Avernus. And you basically cannot enter the plane through any of the other Hells, except for, well, there are some peculiar exceptions, like the Infinite Staircase, but I digress. When people talk about the Hells, more often than not, they speak of Avernus because that is usually all that anyone ever gets to see. And if you plane shift here, this would be where you would stop. And then lastly, third, well, if you played Baldur's Gate 3, a, a lot of what happened there that related to the Hells happened here. This is the hell that Sariel commands. This is the hell where Tiamat, goddess of evil dragons, is located. And this is where the Mind Flayer vessel at the beginning of the game teleported to before it was invaded. So ultimately, if you loved the game and want to know more or get more context about certain events in it, Avernus is what you want to learn more about. Now, with that being said, before we get too deep into this, this video is brought to you by me. I am uh, sponsoring myself to let you all know that Monster Classes 5 is officially out over at MrRex.store. With Monster Classes 5, you can play as a troll, as a gnoll, or as an earth elemental. These function as both your race and your full class, with features all the way up to level 20. And it also includes lore for each of the monsters and useful rollable tables designed to help you create the backstory for your new monstrous class. 
As an earth elemental, you have complete control over rock and stone, be that to manipulate the earth around you or to shape your very own form. You can grow large and become a tank, or focus your might right onto your fist to deal extra damage, or perhaps shrink in size and burrow through the ground. From creating gems right in your body to commanding the elements to assist you, the Earth Elemental is a powerful ally to have. The gnolls are strong, fast, and hard to pin down. With their feature quick step, gnolls can move outside of their turn in order to reposition themselves, a great skill to have in order to help isolate their targets. See, gnolls are powerful against enemies that are either surrounded or left completely separated from their friends. You can be part of Clan Felmaw and adopt Warlock powers, you can be part of Clan Fangbond in order to hunt with a Hyena companion, or Clan Swiftspear to be a martial powerhouse. And then, lastly, the Trolls. They are nearly unkillable. Their legendary regeneration prevents them from dying, unless they sustain acid or fire damage, of course. This they use to their benefit, using their feature Frenzied Attacks to deal extra damage with their strikes at the cost of taking some of that damage as well. And when a troll is below half of their hit points or lower, they enter a Berserk mode that makes them even more formidable. And check out Monster Classes 5 at MrRex.store, the link is in the video description. Thank you all so much for the support, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, back onto the video. Ancient legends say that Avernus used to be an idyllic paradise, a place with green boughs, beautiful mountains, and an overall enchantingly alluring atmosphere. The hell was crafted by Asmodeus, the ruler of the Nine Hells, as a place to attract mortals and tempt them with ways by which to convert them later into devils, either by corrupting or seducing them into committing lawful evil acts, or by offering them contracts in exchange for their souls. And whatever remained of that once beautiful yet insidious place is now nothing more than ancient old forgotten ruins, a result of the Blood War. Avernus now is a wasteland of rock, basically just plains and foothills devoid of any form of natural life. All around, in the ground and in its hills, jagged deposits of obsidian and quartz makes it difficult to traverse, as tripping or otherwise stepping on these jagged formations is painful and all too common. Travelers often say that they see shapes of tormented faces etched into the rocks, with no explanation as to why they might be there. There are no traditional plants and, and certainly no traditional animals in here, as well as no water formations in all of Avernus. And what you get instead are rivers made out of literal blood, and not necessarily conjured by the darkness of this realm either, but blood flowing from the very carcasses that form everywhere on this hell as a result of the never-ending war between the devils and the demons. The blood flows together in these tiny streams that emerge from battlefields that eventually unite into larger rivers, which all inevitably converge onto the River Styx. So, the River Styx. The River Styx is sort of like a planner highway that connects several of the lower planes together. Usually you can't just like travel from one plane to the other. You instead have to find gates or special passageways or, or some kind of connection between the two planes before you can travel from one to the other. And this, this is what the River Styx does, and it's actually the main way by which demons get into Avernus in order to fight in the Blood War. Originally, the River Styx merely passed by the very border of Avernus, but over time, as more and more souls entered the Hell, it grew in size, eventually to the point where now the River Styx passes roughly by the middle of the place. Now, the River Styx is something of an enigma, and because it is not the topic of this video, I'm not gonna dabble too much into it, but its passage by Avernus is of course of great importance, so let's at least touch on some important fundamentals. Anyone that physically touches the River Styx has a chance of losing their memories. With the deeper or more pronounced the contact, the higher the chances, with all but guaranteeing losing all of your memories if ever fully submerged into the river. 
Specifically, the person would lose the types of memories that grant that person a sense of personality and a history. So, such a person would forget everything about themselves, what they have done, or why they're even here, but would not forget how to fight, how to speak, they would still remember random facts about unrelated things or places in their past, and likely would sustain any memory that would be considered either instinctual or deeply practiced. Now, successfully traveling by the river on your own is virtually impossible because the currents constantly shift. New tributaries are always being created, uh, the sections that connect one part of the river with another are in constant flux, and frankly, there is just a lot of magical shenanigans that happen in the river. It doesn't really travel through space in a direct way as one would imagine. For example, the river might travel from point A to point B the first time that you get into it. But then the second time, it might just straight up skip point B and go from point A to point C. The next time, it might go from A to C and then back to B. Its trajectory and its canals are basically impossible for a normal person to be able to discern. And then because of that, the only real way of actually traveling through it is by hiring a unique kind of yugaloth called a merenoloth. It is basically a fiend that almost exclusively serves as fairies for the river. They charge a lot of gold depending on how important or powerful the creature is that is to be ferried and how far they are to be ferried. And yeah, these are the guys that get paid hundreds of thousands of gold pieces to basically ferry demon lords and their armies all throughout the canals into Avernus. Okay, so now back to Avernus. Uh, it is described that most of the rocky land of Avernus is essentially covered in either remnants of bones, blood, or viscera because of all of the fighting that happens here. Uh, there are no stars in the sky, nor is there any sun or moon. Instead, the entire layer is suffused with a blood-red colored light that never wavers or dims. Uh, the monotony of the red sky is, however, interrupted by the constant explosion of fireballs that literally just randomly get created around the hell and just explode. And some of these take on the forms of small meteors, but many of them are just flashes of bright red light that simply create explosions of fire. And these random fireballs are actually one of the greatest threats to non-devils that ever travel into Avernus. And that would include demons as well, because as you know, demons are not immune to fire, they're merely resistant to fire. So big fireballs concentrated inside demonic armies do create substantial damage, especially when they happen all the damn time. But again, for traveling adventurers, one single large fireball exploding right next to you, maybe once or twice a day, can have a very profound negative impact on your ability to explore this realm. The lore states that it functions just like the spell fireball, so basically 86 points of fire damage that just randomly happens every once in a while. These explosions are also said to tend to seek out victims, and some sources even claim that they are attracted by motion, so those that stay still do tend to be far safer than those that don't. Now, other than what has been described, being in Avernus is much like being in any other location in the material plane. You can breathe normally, you can dig into the ground normally, uh, gravity here is basically the same, spells generally do function the same. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say here is that the rules of physics are the same here as they would be in any other location that you might be accustomed to. But there are indeed some very specific unique changes to some schools of magic, though I want to clarify this applies to all of the Nine Hells, and it's not just exclusive to Avernus. So, some examples. Conjuration spells are much harder to produce, and usually require a rigorous ritual before they can even be performed. Not doing the correct ritual usually just results in the summoned creature having free will to disobey your commands, which is really bad because the creature has just been summoned onto a lower plane, which most creatures actively avoid, so it is very likely that the summoned creature is just going to hate you for it. Divination spells cast in the Nine Hells usually give you grim results, and any form of news or information is usually presented in the worst possible light. The divination is going to be truthful, but will focus on terrible omens. Necromantic spells that heal or restore life perform really bad in the Nine Hells. However, those that cause damage, pain, or control the undead do tend to perform exceptionally well. 
And then lastly, what one can call walled magic. So spells that rely on either randomness or are directly fueled by sources of wild magic or the power of chaos. Uh, such magics are very diminished in the Nine Hells. Uh, some examples of this type of magic could be spells like Chaos Bolt, anything that a wild magic sorcerer could basically muster, or potentially the type of power that could be summoned through emotions like magic that could enrage an enemy or the supernatural manifestations of a fae-like creature. All of these types of effects, which can be sort of put under the vague umbrella of wild magic, uh, would become progressively weaker the deeper that you would go into the hells. So they might not be too weakened on Avernus, which is good, but would otherwise be fairly unusable in the deeper layers of the hells. Okay, so now let's talk about the most important factor at play here, which is uh, the famous Blood War. This is not THE Blood War video, so we also won't go in too deep. Now, the Blood War is an eternal war between the Devils of the Nine Hells and the Demons of the Abyss. Uh, this war technically happens everywhere. Uh, there are constant skirmishes in the Material Plane, and probably thousands of fronts scattered all throughout the Lower Plains. However, Avernus is particularly noted for being the main battleground for this terrifying planar war. For starters, uh, what is the difference between devils and demons? Because it's kind of important. So, uh, both are awfully evil groups of creatures, of course, but the main difference is that devils are influenced by law, whereas demons are powered by chaos. Uh, devils are generally very intelligent, they're conniving, deceitful, and their societies are heavily structured with rules and hierarchies. Uh, demons are effectively monsters in all meanings of the word. They live to destroy, other than some of the more powerful ones, they don't really tend to be particularly intelligent, and they sort of exist in a might-makes-right world order. This also perfectly encapsulates how both of them fight in the Blood War. See, devil armies organize themselves into legions who fight with careful strategy. The devils are typically well equipped, they use powerful magical items, they, they craft ingenious tools of war such as metal engines that could almost be described as tanks, honestly, and they make the best out of the layout of the battlefields in which they fight. Demons are, well, they are very powerful and there's too many of them. That, that basically encapsulates their strategy. Uh, one for one, uh, demons are actually uh, generally more powerful than devils, but the devils do make up for it with strategy and coordination. Now, why Avernus? Like, wh why fight here? So, this is mostly, honestly, a, a demon thing, though the devils are also happy enough to fight here as well. See, fiends, which is the umbrella term that we use for all kinds of uh, natural residents of the lower plains, they are only permanently die if they are killed in their natural plane. So, to permanently kill a demon, you would have to kill it in the abyss. To permanently kill a devil, you would have to kill it in the nine hells. So, uh, there is a lot of value for demons to fight in Avernus, as every single devil that they kill dies permanently, whereas any demon that dies is simply brought back over time. Further, and keep in mind that this is strategy, but it's strategy brought forth by demon lords who are very intelligent. Demons want to conquer the multiverse, like that's their thing. They want to consume all, conquer all, destroy all. They just want to go out and bring mayhem wherever they can. However, they know that the second that they begin bringing their infinite armies out into other realms or into the material plane, that that's when angels will get involved in the war. That's when the Githyanki, the gods, the elementals, that's when the rest of the multiverse will band together with the devils most likely to try and take down the demons. This has actually happened before. If you're curious, you should watch this video that I made about the abyss where we cover how demons almost conquer the multiverse. But yeah, and so the demon lords bring their hordes and fight in Avernus because they know very well that those uppity angels are too good to fight side by side with devils in order to protect the nine hells. And they know that nobody ain't gonna help those devils. Now, the devils are happy to fight here, mostly because it is the strategically sensical move. See, in Avernus, 
Devils are more powerful. They are better supplied. They have fortresses. Reinforcements arrive much faster when needed. They have clear front lines that they can use to somewhat funnel the infinite number of demons. Whenever devils die with precious and valuable magical items in their possessions, those magical items can be retrieved easily if, the, if those devils die in Avernus, of course. And interestingly enough, the commanders of the devil armies realize that devils tend to fight with more seal when they know that permanent death is on the line. So it actually makes sense for the devil powers that be to want to fight here. Though I will say that this type of mindset and strategy came from Bael, who used to be the previous lord of the first, the previous lord of Avernus. He is the uh, strategic genius who actually was so good at what he did that the lore says that he literally started as an imp and ended up quickly rising through the ranks until he became a pit lord, all because of his victories in the Blood War. See, again, and, and we don't have to get too deep into it, but there are mostly three ways in which a devil can rise in the hierarchy. And I want to note that hierarchies in hell are extremely important. Not just because it is a plane of law, and hierarchies are everything, but because a devil is literally their stature in this hierarchy. As in, the, the form that a devil takes is a literal representation of the status that they wield. And when a devil is promoted, they change form and become more powerful. Now, the three ways that a devil can use to rise in this hierarchy is either one, collect a lot of souls, uh, two, kill your superior and position yourself to be the next in line for that position, and then three, well, kill a lot of demons in the blood war. And that's exactly what Bael did. Now, Bael is no longer the Lord of the First, and that has something to do with a famous devil that you might recognize, Zariel. Zariel was a powerful angel, a solar in fact, which is the most powerful kind of angel that there is. In fact, when it comes to celestials, the only thing more powerful than a solar is what you would call a celestial paragon, which is essentially like the archdevils or the demon princes, but of the heavens. Uh, they would be the rulers of all of the different upper planes. So yeah, a, a solar is a very big deal. Zariel in particular was a follower of Lathander, the god of light, and served him from the seven mountains of Mount Celestia. Now, Zariel was entrusted with a delicate matter, one of great importance to the safety of the multiverse. She was to track the progress of the Blood War. Simple, but important. Even more important, however, she was forbidden to actually intervene in the Blood War in any way, shape, or form. Zariel was of a mind that she could rally the hosts of Mount Celestia and destroy both the devils and the demons in one fell swoop. In Zariel's eyes, the duty of good was to destroy evil. To let evil fester and continue its existence unimpeded just simply ran contrary to what she believed in, though it is also worth noting that Sariel already had something of a history with Asmodeus, the ruler of the Nine Hells. See, eons ago, the angels of Celestia banded together in order to make a trial against Asmodeus, to bring forth to a powerful court all of the evils that Asmodeus had done, in hopes, of course, that he would face justice for his crimes. The crimes including taking the souls of mortals, transforming people into devils, all manner of slavery, and every despicable thing that you can imagine a devil would do. For pure neutrality, the judge was the primus of Mechanus, the leader of the plane of pure law, effectively the highest authority that there can ever be in matters of law in the multiverse. All of Asmodeus' crimes were laid bare, and of course, Asmodeus argued that everything that he did was for the good of law and the multiverse, claiming that without him and his devils, the demons would simply overrun all of existence and chaos would devour reality. The trial lasted too long, all because of the sheer amount of angels that there were, and the sheer amount of complaints and sins that they had amassed for the trial, and even, even Primus himself grew tired of the length of the trial, so he said that only a few more angels would be hurt. This caused a ruckus amongst the angels, as they tried to decide who would be the one to speak, 
before indeed Sariel in her seal and the termination demanded that she be allowed to speak, which was actually the spark that caused many of the angels to devolve into infighting and ironically uh, to become unruly or not law abiding, so to speak. It was this infighting that caused Primus to stop the trial. In the end, he did not rule for or against Asmodeus, but he did command Asmodeus to always carry the ruby rod with him at all times, which would become basically a, a lawful symbol of authority that would always allow devils to forge packs with willing mortals and uh, a symbol that would severely punish devils if they ever broke any contract or bargain that they would ever make. So going back to Sariel, uh, one would be hard pressed to find an angel that might hate Asmodeus as much as her. And one who instigated and most likely participated in the angelic brawl that caused the trial of Asmodeus to run afoul. Yet she was forbidden by her superiors to act in the blood war, to, to enter the lower planes and bring war to the fiends. Yet that is exactly what in the end she ended up doing. One of the villages under her protection happened to be attacked by Yinogu, the demon lord of the Knolls, and this just simply sent her onto a rage. Zariel trained and gathered an army of knights and paladins from the holy city of El Turel. That is the city in Baldur's Gate 3 where all of the tieflings are coming from. And uh, with those paladins and knights, they charged into Avernus. Uh, this, by the way, might just be the coolest art that I have seen in all of my years covering Dungeons and Dragons. Angelic Sariel, riding Lulu, her holy friend companion, as she commands the Hell Riders of Elturel to charge against the legions of Hell commanded by Bel, the Lord of the First. It just, it just doesn't get any cooler than this, like absolutely bravo. Now, unfortunately though, Zariel lost. Overwhelmed by the sheer number of devils that she was facing, in the end, as the Solar Laid defeated, she was allowed to recover and was offered a pact by Asmodeus, a deal which she accepted. Serial would gain power, even more power than she had before, and she would gain the armies of the Nine Hells for her to use against the demons that she so deeply wanted to destroy. Zariel was made the new Lord of the First, to rule over Avernus and be the highest commander in the largest war that ever was. This was the fall of Zariel the Solar, but the rise of Archduchess Zariel. Quote, My legions are the only thing standing between your precious seven heavens and the bottomless hunger of the abyss. I did not fall into the clutches of evil. I rose to shoulder a cosmic burden. End quote. Now, in this form, Zariel is one of the most powerful creatures in Dungeons and Dragons, having a challenge rating of 26. By comparison, uh, the Tarask is a challenge rating 30. A Tiamat is also a challenge rating 30 creature. At this level, Zariel is equally as powerful as both Demogorgon and Orcus, and likely at this level, she's probably the most physically powerful archdevil in the Nine Hells, outside of Asmodeus, of course. Uh, Bale was recently given a stat block, uh, and he was given a challenge rating of 25, so that does put him very close to her, but a little bit below her. Now, speaking of Bell, he was indeed demoted by Asmodeus, as he was interested to see uh, what Sariel could do, someone perhaps less focused on slow incremental victories and more keen to make strong, daring moves in the Blood War. Something that Bell, in his tactical mind, did not prefer. Uh, Bell was then ordered by Asmodeus to support and advise Sariel, and of course, forbade him from fighting her, though of course, uh, as you can imagine him being a devil and this being the Nine Hells, uh, Bell has been working to undermine and supplant Zariel to regain his stature as the Lord of the First, though uh, that hasn't quite happened yet. And so the Blood War continues in Avernus. Unlike Bell, Sariel fights the demons in the front lines and actually treats her devils and her allies quite well, or um, okay, let me ref let me rephrase that. She treats those that are useful to her very, very well. Now, what does that mean? Well, Zariel is a very pragmatic leader, and she is truly invested in defeating the demons. Unlike Bell, who, you know, deep inside, he understood that demons are infinite, 
and he saw no real chance at an actual victory. Whereas Sariel believes deep in her now, very dark hard, uh, that there is victory. She's very idealistic in that way. She also knows that abusing or, or harming her own troops or allies it would be counterproductive to the goal at hand, and so Zariel is actually quite open with having mortals help her in the war, or assist her in whatever it is that she needs. And interestingly, she has a very specific rule that she follows, where she refuses to trick or otherwise attempt to claim the soul of useful mortals that assist her. Uh, but you do have to be useful to her for this to even apply to you. Uh, but because of this, you do see now the option for adventurers to work for her either in the Blood War or out in the Material Plane. Now, this change is actually meaningful because literally the main reason why devils seek souls is because they turn those souls into more devils, which they then use in the Blood War. It is the fact that Avernus, and by consequence the rest of the Nine Hells, is in constant danger that is actually the, the driving force that devils use into claiming more and more souls. So, in a way, deep, maybe, maybe really, really deep in Zariel's soul, she does strive somewhat to minimize the collection of souls, and instead a mass support in whatever way that, that might look like. Now, don't get me wrong, Sariel's soul is very, very much corrupted and she is extremely evil. Uh, she tortures and murders and, and has no space in her mind for weaklings that are of no use to her, but, but it's also worth noting that she is still not truly, fully, irredeemably gone. That there is something there, a spark. Even if infinitesimally small, it is there. A spark that maybe could be rekindled. And there could be a way to do that, but I will choose not to spoil it because it does deal with a 5th edition adventure. Uh, Descent into Avernus is a 5th edition adventure that does take, indeed, players uh, right into Avernus. So if you were interested in playing there, then you then you should give this adventure a try. Though I will say, word of warning, the reviews for this adventure were not too positive. So uh, the DM might have to do a lot of work to make it all function well, but I digress. We will definitely cover more of this, though, in the future. There is quite a bit to talk about both the Blood War and, and just, of course, Devils in general. So before I end the video, I do want to quickly go over general locations and features of Avernus, since, again, this technically was supposed to be the Avernus video after all. The fortress where Bell used to rule over the realm, which is now Sariel's lair, is called the Bronze Citadel. And you basically have a, a massive fortification in the middle, which is then surrounded by about 14 concentric rings of walls. It is like this because the fortress has been getting expanded throughout the eons that the Blood War has been in place. Each wall has its own gates and fortresses and, and several layers of protections, including uh, powerful magical artifacts and devastating ballistas. Uh, the whole complex is said to be over 600 square miles, 600 square miles in territory. Uh, that is about a fifth of Puerto Rico, all just part of a single large fortress. Uh, now, Tiamat's lair is said to be the main and most well-known path leading towards the city of Dis, uh, the second layer of the Nine Hells. And she functions as something of a gatekeeper or protector for this entrance, though really uh, that task falls onto her servants, the Abishai, draconic devils under her command. Uh, they don't really stop people from going into this path that leads into the second layer unless they look like they really don't belong here. <laughs> the creatures that go through the passage with intent, who look powerful and abled, are usually left alone, but those that look uncertain and afraid, those are the guys that are attacked and destroyed by the Abishai. If you want to know more about Tiamat, I highly recommend this video where we go really deep into everything that you might want to know about the goddess of evil dragons. Now, we already talked about the River Styx, so the only other real important place that is worthy of note here would be the Shelves of Despond. Uh, this is a large area around the River Styx where the souls of evil people are sent to after they die in the material realm. Basically, this is where the evil souls spawn in here. Uh, barbed devils are constantly on the lookout for new souls here, and when such a devil finds one, they usually can automatically know to which archdevil does the soul belong to. Of course, depending on whether the mortal signed some kind of contract that got him uh, here or pledged himself in some way to a devil. Now, otherwise, if the soul has not been claimed, it can be claimed by the barbed devil in the name of whoever archdevil it supports. 
After that, well, you know, the soul can be tortured <laughs> for a very, very long time in a process that slowly destroys the soul, uh, but produces divine energy that can then be used by devils for power. Or the soul can be sent to a place called the maggot pit, where the soul is irrevocably corrupted and tainted, which uh, turns the soul into a lemur, the lowest form of devil. In other words, a soul can either be squeezed for power or it can be turned into a servant to fight in the army. Oh, and uh, whenever I say souls in the context of the Nine Hells, I don't, I don't mean like a wispy ethereal essence, like a ghost. No, uh, souls in the Nine Hells look like bedraggled, emaciated versions of the people that they used to be. They look like a hollowed out person from Dark Souls, basically. <laughs> I mean, literally, that's how they look like. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, about that for Avernus. The only other interesting thing, I suppose, is that Kurtzulmac, uh, the god of kobolds, actually lives here, but there really isn't much that I can or, or would make sense for me to talk about here. And uh, now that we have a general feel for the first layer of hell, I think I can now either go deeper into the Blood War uh, or go deeper into how the Nine Hells function and how devils generally behave and what it is that they do. Uh, do let me know in the comments what specifically you would like to know more about, which direction you would like to go in. I'm, I'm really uh, down either way. So yeah, we could take it in several ways from here. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, do make sure to check out my new Monster Classes 5 at MrRex.store. I am just absolutely in love with the troll, and I really want you guys to see it. They can, they can sacrifice their own body parts to help prevent damage taken by an ally, and at higher levels, they can even rip off their own limbs and control them while separated from their body. They are nuts. MrRex.store. The, the link is in the video description below. Please check out Monster Classes 5, guys. I am really proud of it. I I just want you guys to see it. <laughs> but thank you all for watching the video, and I'll, I'll see you all next time.